Hi, I'm Tom Woods, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm your host, Doug Stewart, and because this is Valentine's Day week, we are going to talk about love. And I have a special guest with us, Sarah Estelle, who is an associate professor of economics at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. She's also a research fellow of Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty in Grand Rapids. She is also the founder and director of a student program at Hope College, Markets and Morality, and she runs the website econisforlovers.com. So clearly she's the best guest to talk about economics and love. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Doug. So Valentine's Day this week, so I'm going to just have to ask, what's one of your favorite Valentines? Like, If you were to write an econ nerd Valentine for your husband, what would it be? Well, I think it would have to be to express to him my my joint utility function, um, right? Our joint utility function that I uh, appreciate his well-being so much that it in fact impacts my own satisfaction. And I might even get a little more specific and tell him that uh, the marginal utility that I get from time spent with him never diminishes. And it's too bad we don't have a chart to show (laughs) because you you have a slide that shows this line. (laughs) It's linear. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I mean, and this is what how it really expresses my love is that is just ridiculous, right? Because obviously the law of diminishing marginal utility says that's impossible. <laughs> and that's, I have that kind of love for my husband that I would even break the law of diminishing marginal utility for him. All right. So we've, we've demonstrated to start <laughs> that you are a romantic for economics. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, and I'm a bit of an econ nerd. But yes. Tell, tell us true. why. Oh, gosh, I just I think economics is just a wonderfully powerful set of tools. And so if you care about something, you should want to know some economics that's that's relevant to it. When I heard Aquinas's definition of love the first time, which is that to love is to will the good of another, my mind just started racing Mm. about what it means to do good. Uh, And it led me to asking people, friends of mine with more uh, theological training, what does will really mean and to unpack that. And I just can't help but see that you have to know some economics in order to love according to this definition of love. I had a friend once who, actually, he's still a friend now that I should say. Uh, I have a friend who at one point in our you know friendship, we started talking about like, social justice and things like that. And I said something about economics and how he should learn a little bit of economics. And I wasn't saying that and like, hey, you should learn economics. It's just kind of like, hey, you know, if you really care about this kind of thing, economics would be helpful. And he's like, well, I don't want to. I'm like, well, if you care about social justice, economics is going to help you quite a bit because yes. it does have to do with human behavior and you know how we, how we interact with one another. Um, You know, there's a lot of disciplines out there. My wife is a psychologist, and so she studies human behavior. And economists would say that they study human behavior, and Mm -hmm. sociologists would say that they study human behavior. So how does an economist study human behavior differently from some of those other disciplines? Yeah, well, in many different, I think, dimensions, we differ. In terms of our scope, we don't diverge that much from the social sciences in in general. Uh, We might push a bit further. We might have a a slightly broader scope, but I think it's really in our methodology and in our outlook or perspective. Um, So I think the starting place, if well done, economics should be rooted in understanding of human nature. Mm. The human person, uh, if I put a little bit of a, a Christian lingo on it, has been created as an individual, acts as an individual, but also is comes into this world as part of a society or a small society of a a family, and that our human nature is characterized by self-interest. We have to be careful what we mean by that, but I think that that is a a basic understanding of economics that other disciplines might want to push back against. I think also what Christians might refer to as the created order of things, the, the reality of the situation that we find ourselves in, the constraints that we face, that that's really important to the economic way of thinking. 
in particular, the idea that scarcity is a universal state of things. Um, it's not just the result of uh, localized poverty or corruption or something that we can kind of manage our ways out of, that in fact, if we define scarcity as having finite resources, despite the fact we have unlimited wants, that that is a a major perspective and a, a major motivation to economics. If we have scarcity, we have to make choices. When we make choices, we face trade-offs, and those trade-offs incur us costs. Whether money is involved or not, there are costs. And all of this needs to be understood before we can get a handle on human behavior, why humans do what they do, and the consequences of our actions. Well, and the other aspect of that is when you do more empirical economics, you actually study what Mm -hmm. people do. You know, like you can sort of, uh, you know, like politicians or, I mean, even economists would do that. I mean, humans tend to do this. We're like, okay, well, if we just put these sort of incentives in place, forget whether it's state-based or not. We put these sort of incentives in place and then, you know, people are going to do this. And then all of a sudden they run this, you know, they can run a simulation or study or do something like that. And they're like, oh, wow, we didn't, we didn't see that uh, people would behave a certain way. We didn't predict that. Right. Right. Yeah. I think economists are very attuned to the, the warning that you'll get even in an intro statistics course. Our students hear it all the time. Correlation is not causation. Mm -hmm. But I think economics among the social sciences is really uniquely situated to deal with that. In terms of our perspective, we're aware of, for example, unintended consequences. Uh, We're aware that good intentions don't necessarily bring about what we were hoping. But even in terms of our empirical methodology and the expectations for scholarship and research, economists really put a lot of emphasis on cause and effect. And that's going to be important for an individual wanting to love a family member or a neighbor well. It's going to be important for a policymaker who actually cares about the results of the policy to think in terms of cause and effect, not just good intentions. So I think many of our listeners are broadly familiar with what you're saying here. And they're like, of course, you know, if we want to love our neighbor, we should make sure that we, you know, first do no harm to them. You know, loving your neighbor doesn't mean you hire the state to like tell them to put up solar panels or pay a big fine or buy insurance or whatever those things. Right. When you, because you're a professor, I think might you're probably good at coming up with examples that you know young people. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that. I'm like, I thought I was a young person. But, <laughs> uh, that young people are kind of like, ah, you know, to help them get it. Like, how do you demonstrate? What do do you have any like illustrations or examples of like how do you illustrate to somebody that loving your neighbor or just that economics in general can help them understand how not to love their neighbor? Maybe that may be a better way of putting it. Like, how can you actually do harm to your neighbor thinking you're doing well? Right. Well, if I'm going to cut right to the crux of it, I would have to bring one of my favorite economists into the conversation. And I do this routinely, even in my introductory economics classes, and that's Friedrich Hayek, um, F.A. Hayek's observations uh, about local knowledge are so important for understanding actually loving someone that is willing their good, orienting yourself towards their good. You need particular knowledge to do that. And the number one most motivating issue among our students here at Hope College, I'd say even above, not that it's it's totally separate from, but even beyond kind of the general social justice concerns is poverty. And I think it's because many of our students have engaged in things that they have believed and hope have positively contributed to people who are experiencing material poverty, whether in a church youth group or a service program on campus, or they're thinking of their career later on uh, really being focused on global poverty, oftentimes global poverty, not so much local poverty, Mm -hmm. which is an interesting point. Um, And so I want to help them understand Uh, What are the consequences that we've observed? Or maybe even more, what consequences do we not observe? So I'm thinking of uh, the documentary Poverty, Inc., which my students have, all of them that have seen it, really appreciate it and I think find it even convicting. It's a film that really points out that foreign aid over decades flowing from the West or from the United States towards developing countries really has not raised any country out of Mm -hmm. poverty. And 
so we want to talk about why is that? What does sending quote unquote free food or free clothing to other countries do for their ability to be productive and use their God-given talents to uh, sustain themselves and, and have human flourishing? And fundamentally, at, at the root of the problem here is that we're acting in a certain way without the knowledge to the particular local situation. And so that's where I like to bring in Hayek's teaching on local knowledge, because it allows us to kind of delineate spaces where explicit altruism is effective and spheres or domains that are so large that altruism and instinct, he would say, are not effective at all. Um, it's, you know, the idea that our reason can lead us to these superior ways of doing things on a large scale, he refers to as a fatal conceit. So what, what would be some examples of where altruism is, is useful or, or effective? Yeah. So according to Hayek, and I have to say I concur, uh, that within families and what he says can rightly be referred to as societies. Uh, he's, a, he's not a fan of the word society, as in all of civilization, mm -hmm. but where there is knowledge, where there is shared motivation, uh, where there are properly ordered intentions and incentives, where those are all co-located. Mm -hmm. uh, with the people we're aiming to serve, then we can act with altruism. We can operate a family based on central planning to wonderful benefit because we have the proper incentives and we have the proper information, the needed information there. So within our small groups where we really know what are the assets available within your local community, what are the apparent needs, and we can think about what are the objectives and and Ideally, we share those objectives so that we can work together on those things. Hayek would point out that this wonderful extended order, he calls it, the civilization more as a whole, um, what he also calls the macrocosmos, has not achieved this order and what we should definitely talk about, the just immense increase in well-being and wealth around the world because of altruism. It's happened to steal a phrase from Adam Smith, a bit as if by an invisible hand, yeah, right? right? But because, because of this, individuals pursuing within their own spheres things to really make themselves and their families better off, but within this larger context of a rule of law and, and trust and trade that happens um, on a larger scale that just allows us to do amazing things, but not by some particular... Uh, collective reasoning that has brought us to a superior way of doing things on this this larger scale. Yeah. I mean, I've often, you know, in shorthand discussions with people on Facebook about, you know, what society can do or, you know, like people are posting things lately in the past year or so. This whole Medicare for all thing has been kind of popular. And I have some left-leaning friends who are not left-leaning, they're left. They're left, left, left <laughs> leftist friends sure. who are like, oh, well, look, it works for Sweden or it works for this country yeah. or whatever, which is, you know, way smaller than the United States. Also a lot more homogeneous in socioeconomic makeup yeah. and all kinds of ways. And I'm like, you know, I could sort of see, you know, those things happening on smaller scales in the United States, you know, and maybe mm -hmm. be as successful as what they're claiming they are in the Nordic countries, even though I think some of their claims are overstated and they ignore all the kinds of things that most libertarians would want to see uh, mm -hmm. removed from the state. Um, but I often, so my back to what I often say is like, well, there's a scalability problem, you know, in that, you know, you can have what Hayek, and I think I got it from Hayek. I mean, I haven't read a ton of Hayek, but I think it was from him. It's kind of like, you know, this whole smaller societies, I didn't realize that distinction is something that can, you can be altruistic, but then as soon as you, at some point you add more and more people to define what we are, whatever what that means. And it just isn't going to work. And it's going to work yeah. less and less and less effectively. Mm -hmm. I think that that term scalability is as useful as a, a jumping off point uh, to thinking of just about that size matters. In this case, are you talking about it, a true society um, rooted in this idea of fraternity and shared concern? Are, are we talking about something where it would just be unnatural to know or care to the degree we would need to for someone on the opposite side of the world that, that we don't know? It's not that, right, 
with Aquinas' definition of love, let's be clear, it's not a theoretical thing. It's an act. It's an orientation. Mm -hmm. And so Hayek uh, would say that in the in the macrocosmos, we just don't have available to us what we would need to do the quote unquote right thing or or good or benef- beneficial thing. And so scalability, I think that that resonates a bit here. But we want to be clear on what is what are the constraints that make scalability an issue? Um, if we mean by scalability just that there's too much to be done for a system to handle, that's not, it's not quite that. It's really the the nature of the human condition and the quote unquote problem, right? The, the economic problem, mm-hmm. scarce resources, unlimited wants. And I think that's important to point out because sometimes um, people raise the concern that, uh, or thought maybe that Hayek's ideas about local knowledge are a little out of date because we've got big data, mm-hmm. <laughs> because we right. have technology and we could just crank through so much more. But it's really not an issue of cranking through more people and more problems. Uh, knowledge, he points out in his wonderful essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society, uh, it's not data, it's not facts, it's not scientific expertise. Knowledge is the kind of information that exists with understanding and the ability to, it has implications, it can be applied. There's more than just the statement of a fact or a data point. And I just can't imagine how big data is ever going to reach the level of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, data and knowledge are two, in, in some ways, two different things because you, knowledge, you kind of need a brain to kind of assess the kinds of things that yeah. interpret, interpret yeah. and, you know, make, you know, and even have characteristics like empathy and some mm. sort of judgment in, yes. in a certain way. I mean, we had, we had Jay Richards on to talk about, this is probably last year, I think, to talk about how AI is not going to take over our jobs. You yes. know, that there is always going to be a human element to what we do with our world uh, and how we how we act and how we labor. So on, on a local level, we can be somewhat altruistic and we can because we can have like we can act on our own. Whereas, you know, on a on a global level, it's not quite gonna work that way. Right. But economics, you know, bring this back to the theme of, you know, love and love your neighbor and things like that. Like, how can somebody like it's very difficult for me to, quote unquote, care about the people who are affected. Like, let's say right now it's the uh, brush fires in Australia. You know, I mean, on the one hand, I think about it and you watch a story about, you know, a particular family who's you know lost somebody or whatever. And you think, oh, wow, I, I really feel for them. There's nothing else. There's really nothing right. I can do, right? I mean, I, I mean, even even voting for a type of candidate who would tend to knee jerk send them aid. If let's say that's that's not even something right. that would be useful, but um, you know, I have zero control over what happens around the world. Mm-hmm. And so, what what does that mean for the average Christian to know that they they almost it almost makes me feel helpless, but at the same time, maybe yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I have a perfect answer, if there is such a thing, to that question. But here's where I currently am on my own thinking is I know at the margin, thinking like an economist, at the margin, I probably need to challenge myself to do more locally and be okay with that. I, somehow in our you know collective consciousness, somehow in our society, we, in our culture, we have built up international poverty efforts and other efforts to to somehow just be a different moral level. And I, I can get that when we think about, you know, poverty in the United States versus poverty in um, certain developing nations. There is a, a real difference there, but it, it's almost, I don't know, for my students, they just don't even know where to go with that. What if as a student, I can't go somewhere? What if I don't have the time or money to engage mm-hmm. on that scale? Well, gosh, I guess I'll just take four years off from loving my neighbor because these neighbors... Not as exciting, not as right. <laughs> Facebook photo friendly or something like. Look what I'm doing for. I've even had a colleague say that sometimes she tells her, uh, will remind her students, your roommate is your neighbor, you know. So you could actually love them well, and that would be a good start. But you know, in our in our church congregations, on our 
streets and our blocks and our our hometowns? Are we uh, ministering well to people around us? Are we, quote unquote, doing life together, uh, as some Christians like to say, in, in a way that leads to human flourishing? Now, does that mean we want to put all our eggs in that basket? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I would suggest that people who want to engage on a national or international scale identify some good sources on what nonprofits, for example, are doing good work. And I don't just mean well-intended work, um, that they're actually having the impact they set out to have. There are websites like GiveWell Mm -hmm. uh, that look at the effectiveness of programs. We might think we want to look kind of at the, the basic budget of some of these organizations. It used to be a few years ago, everyone was really pushing for donating to organizations with low overhead where they weren't paying their executive level officials to very much money. But right. now people are saying, no, actually, if you're going to be the visionary for a major international nonprofit, we want to attract you from other market-based opportunities. We want to be able to pay you market rates so that we get uh, the right vision and the, uh, the right skill set there at the helm. So I would say looking at solid research uh, about what organizations are doing good work, measured on their consequences, uh, on the outcomes, and also pay attention to whether the organization you're donating to has local knowledge. That is, are they located in the place where they're doing mm -hmm. their work? That would be kind of difficult for a CEO or executive director of a nonprofit that does sort of like aid work that is mm -hmm. that is global because they have to rely on the local knowledge of the people below yes. them. You know, yes. they have to make these like high level decisions. It's real. I think it's interesting to think about local knowledge within organizations. This may be a topic for another conversation, but just how does one uh, structure, whether it's a business or a nonprofit organization, to really motivate people with local knowledge to share it with their coworkers or their supervisor in a way that local knowledge can be harnessed for the greater good of the organization. But you're right, when it's when it's a big group, that that's going to be tough for the leader, the CEO level person to have himself that local knowledge. I guess it will have to work out to be something like... Um, what, a bit of a Venn diagram of, of sorts of, of different spheres of authority that exist within that organization where the overall organization empowers the people closer to that local need and local knowledge to work. And I think that's why a, a lot of folks are supporting things like, if not giving livestock, even giving cash to mm -hmm. farmers because they think, okay, there, there's local knowledge there or empowering um groups, uh, let's say a group of women in a small town to save money and make loans, small business loans to each other out of that money and really to maybe help set up structures, but allow the actual implementation to happen through the wisdom of the people who have, have their skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody, Bob Murphy here. Wanted to let you know that on April 20th of 2020, I am going to be debating at the Soho Forum in New York City and the topic is going to be whether Christians should support free market capitalism. So, of course, I'm going to be in the affirmative. My opponent, Tony Campola, is going to be in the negative. If you're interested, I encourage you to get tickets sooner rather than later. Go to libertarianchristians.com slash debate and use the promo code LCI25, all lowercase, in order to get 25% off the ticket price. So, again, that's libertarianchristians.com slash debate. Use promo code LCI25, all lowercase. Hope to see you there. So one question that's kind of coming to mind as you're talking about some of those things and local knowledge and in hiring the kind of, you know, in a nonprofit world, you know, as this discussion has gone on, the kind of people who are going to affect change and get the consequences rather than, or get the, you know, what the results do we want? And it isn't quite so important how much they are made and how much they make. And... You know, one thing that I have noticed that people really worry about, people who, you know, either on really, really conservative or really, really liberal progressive side, they worry about people having too much. And I often wonder, like, you know, I've been in a hospital before because, you know, I have kids, you know, I've, I have friends and family who have been in hospitals and we visit and I see all of the stuff that is life, literally life sustaining mm -hmm. that are inventions like just things from like plastics 
to the like the way in which you mold plastic together to get some sort of this or that effect and like to save money by doing a design differently and just all the innovations that you see in a place like a hospital or even innovations that yeah. you see in terms of like even not foreign aid but like aid to poor people that are it's nonprofit mm-hmm. part of me is in my mind and maybe it's just because I know economics a little bit it's like I don't really care how rich the people are who made these life-saving devices for these hundreds of people that are in this hospital let alone the millions of people around the country who are benefiting from it like why like so in some ways does to to bring back to the love like are all those people who are making lots of money loving their neighbor well i mean would that be one way to look at me let's be like an uncharitable way but so the language i would use around that is it's love like because in markets i can provide an environment that encourages love like activity so it won't explicitly be willing myself to do good for some other that I know. But in my work life, if I'm motivated by something like a profit motive or my own family's well-being, to do things that other people value that make their lives better, and I think that's especially clear to see in a hospital setting and, and medical advancements, then you know, the the research and development process and the many, many labs and and engineers and 3D printing experts and all these people that work on these things have not been loving your loved one that's in the hospital, but they've been doing something that is, I don't want to say analogous, but it's love-like in that it does work toward their good. So yes, there I think the profit motive is actually really helpful. Even I, I think we even see it in, let me give an example of uh, domestic uh, refugee resettlement. Uh, one of my first volunteering roles as an adult was in a city in the United States working for the the official refugee resettlement agency, which means that it got a lot of government grants to take in hundreds of people a year and get them settled in the city. And as an economist going there, I I noticed a couple of things right off the bat. One, I was shocked to see that the caseworkers were only available for two and a half hours every Tuesday afternoon to the actual refugees. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really unexpected to me. That's really limiting. Yes. It, it kind of belied a maybe a, an evolution of sorts of uh, maybe feeling taken advantage of or being overworked and therefore having to put limitations and defining things more mm-hmm. and not really having an allocation mechanism, I guess, to help figure out you know what uh, refugee and which problem needs to be addressed when. So there was just signs on each door that said, you know, these hours, this day, that's when you could talk to your caseworker. The other thing I noticed was there was a lot of amazing work going on around the city in churches and various nonprofit medical clinics and things. Um, but what I noticed was the sorts of things they were doing, sometimes there was a, a large degree of overlap. Uh, there wasn't coordination, um, official or, or otherwise, and it, it wasn't really really clear even who was who was doing what. And I don't, I don't know to what extent, you know, a central coordination within a city would work, but I thought information would be valuable. So I approached the refugee resettlement agency and I said, would it be okay? I'm a volunteer. You're not paying me. Would it be okay with you if I uh, tried to survey the organizations that are working with, with the refugees to understand what they're doing, what they're trying to accomplish? Because I've heard from some families that each of their kids at the start of school has like six new book bags, but I don't think the mom knows how to use her oven yet. Mm. Uh, Wouldn't it be great if we could catalog all of the things that are going on, understand where there's overlap and where there are gaps? And the worker uh, who I was speaking to said to me, I don't know, that sounds like a bad idea because if it looks like there's overlap, they're going to be thinking that we're doing too much and they're going to cut our budget. (laughs) I was... So crestfallen, I thought, oh no, efficiency, <laughs> right? Efficiency because of effectiveness like, for these people. Oh my goodness. Like if, yeah. people, if, a, if a normal company is like, hey, look how efficient we're getting, like and we're, we're getting these accomplishments and people throw money and say, do that more. Yes. <laughs> and so it's the exact opposite. And I just thought, oh no, where, where do we go from here? Um, and I, and I sensed the, just really troubling incentives to make the needs more apparent rather than actually meeting the needs. 
Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, you know, the other way to think about that is like, well, if you if they'll cut your budget because you're being more efficient, then maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> like that that money is going to go to, go to somewhere else. Yes. You know, I mean, yeah, just thinking in true. that frame of that frame of reference. Yeah, you know, th- this is all really, I think, really helpful to like think about examples, real world examples of how the impact of the way we think about ourselves, about what we do, whether it's, and, and I don't mean just us, like just the person, the worker there, just thinking kind of self-interestedly, like, you know, this is, our budget's going to go down and that, yeah. you know, they might be thinking, oh, well, we clearly don't want lower budgets because we're doing such good work. Right. And so maybe she wasn't being like, oh, well, if we have lower budgets, maybe my job will be gone or something like that. Right. So we don't have to, so we don't have to attribute ill motive, but sure. that, that kind of thing still happens. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people who don't value economic freedom underestimate how much people, like they say, they're like, oh, well, people are, you know, so selfish. Um, That's why we can't have like a libertarian like world uh, because people are too selfish. Yet all of the constraints that they expect people to live under, they don't, they don't think that those same (laughs) attributes apply. Right. Right. Yeah. No, human, human nature, self-interested. Um, I even tell my students sometimes, um, I point to the scripture, um, in the Psalms where it says, as the deer panteth for the water, to me, that's a sign that, uh, self-interest may very well have preceded (laughs) the fall, that it's a real Mm -hmm. natural kind of motivation for doing things that are good for us, um, that God wants us to do. And so hunger and thirst and need for relationship and um, those kind of things are natural. And so self-interest shouldn't immediately turn us off. And we should understand also that we're not able to turn it off. Uh, we should reject greed and selfishness, but uh, self-interest is is much broader broader than that. Uh, it certainly accounts for people who we know well enough to care for in an explicit way. So it doesn't have to be selfishness. Right. So you've you've given a talk that um, we'll post on the show notes page. A link to it. Uh, it was at Acton the ACT Institute. And I believe it was about a year ago because it was in like uh, February or so of of 2019 uh, that had to do with love. And, you know, people can see the slide of the, uh, the, the utility, the utility slide, Valentine. Yes. Um, and you don't want to steal it, right? For your own Valentine's. Everyone's (laughs) going that route. I'm going to need to do that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But one of the things that you spoke about was human flourishing. So where does that whole theme, where, where does that whole idea of like what human flourishing is relate to uh, economics? Yeah, great. Um, well, flourishing, I think for a Christian, and I'm neither a philosopher or a theologian, so I have to admit that this is a, a combination of what I think are just really good ideas and inspiring ideas from friends of mine with expertise in those areas. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my God is good and with a capital G and has our good in mind at heart. And that would be the fullness uh, represented uh, or that we mean by human flourishing. So living in to- living toward that. And so loving someone is to first and foremost will a, a whole relationship for them with God. So whole and unbroken relationships amongst ourselves, but also with God conducive to that, uh, and certainly not antithetical to that, are more kind of earthly concerns like, I don't know, being able to feed yourself and your family mm-hmm. and and the ability to think beyond those basic survival needs. And so oftentimes when people talk about human flourishing, they think about poverty, they, they think about even wealth. I know wealth is a, is a loaded term and, and sometimes, you know, something that, that people really worry about. But Let's be clear, wealth is is not the default. It's not something um, well-being, high standards of living are, are not something I think we should throw away uh, too very quickly or easily. There's It's a stark trade-off. It's only been really for the last 200 years that mankind has not just been spending every waking minute fighting for survival. Um, Slight exaggeration? I don't know. But only slight. Um, 200 years ago, 95% of the world lived on less than $2 a day. 
inflation adjusted. And, and many people think that that hasn't changed. Uh, yeah, and uh, many people, if you if you pull them, sometimes I do this when I give this lecture, I, I ask people, uh, the lecture about the economic ways of loving, um, what they think is going on with poverty. And, and many of many students will say it's increasing. I think we're living kind of in a time of outrage and crisis after crisis. And we think everything is unprecedented in a negative way. <laughs> like they weren't living right, in yeah. unprecedented times of disaster. <laughs> um, and I've just heard various, um, you know, economic historians say things about, well, you know, some. 300 years ago, 500 years ago, people would live in one room with their whole family, all of their livestock, birds would be nesting in the roof. Um, you had one set of clothing you might get to wash a couple times a year because it was your only clothing. Everyone had skin diseases. And again, not being a historian, even that was eye-opening to me. Wow, you would itch every day of your life. Mm. Huh. Huh. Yeah, that doesn't sound like flourishing. And so to think about what I think markets have done for our ability to be fed and clothed and housed so that we can consider and put more effort 24 hours in a day and only so much energy in our our human bodies that we can consider bigger things and serve one another in more explicit ways and um, just do more with the time and the energies that we have. It's pretty fascinating. So I guess I, since many people don't think the statistic has changed, we should be clear that current statistics say less than 10% of the world now lives on less than $1.90 a day. That's a huge change mm. where for thousands of years people fought for survival. In the last 200 years, we've had big improvements. And I think Hayek uh, would tell us that this is much about the extended order that results from uh, trade between families, that price mechanisms really matter for this. And I love to hear stories, especially from Christian economists. I'm thinking um, PJ Hill, Professor Emeritus from from Wheaton College, uh, the first time I heard him describe uh, the institutional revolution that preceded the industrial revolution. And he said the institutional revolution points right back to the Christian notion of each human being made in the image of God. Uh, Just a beautiful, beautiful idea. And I think the logic tracks nicely. And there are a lot of scholars that have kind of put together those pieces, I think, to, to tell us that a Christian view of this, this universal brotherhood underlies the effectiveness of institutions that led to this market, even globalization, that has brought this billions and billions of people, uh, one billion people just in the last 30 years, out of poverty. Sarah, this has been a fun conversation, and I hope our listeners can just feel a deeper appreciation and love for economics, and hopefully they'll share this with other people who can kind of be... I don't know, just like what their appetite for like what the economic way of thinking and the economic way of loving can do for the way they they look at the world. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for the invitation. I had a nice time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hey, podcast listeners. Since you like listening to audio content, we wanted to let you know about a new audiobook titled Called to Freedom, Why You Can Be Christian and Libertarian. It's read by me, Jacqueline Isaacs, one of the contributing authors of the book, and every download helps to support the Libertarian Christian Institute. To learn more and to download the audiobook today, go to calltofreedombook.com.